uh, welcome you to our final idea fact. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> I, I, I haven't made that mistake all semester, so I think I'm more than one, okay? Okay. So our final humanity and technology uh, lecture of the semester, um, it has been a really uh, stellar first term. Uh, we're really excited to see this initiative move forward. Um, I want to just thank, again, all of our fantastic partners, both uh, this semester and next semester. So the College of Arts and Sciences has been a huge supporter, um, as has been the College of Architecture and Design, a little bit on that in just a moment. Um, the Teagle Foundation is really what made this semester happen, um, so i especially um, grateful to them. Um, we also got a really nice plug last night during um, the Grand Challenge Scholars Program launch celebration, uh, and it was very cool to see those two initiatives um, uh, overlap and support one another. Um, and then, the, oh, I'm not done. The Marburger STEM Center, I saw Dr. Collins just step in the room. Thank you again for your support. We had such a fantastic um, event on the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein. And then, uh, last but not least, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, which will be uh, also partnering with us next uh, semester for our slate of speakers. Which brings me <laughs> to the next semester uh, schedule, which we are happy to announce as well. Um, so I'll just quickly mention the, the uh, dates and the speakers and titles. I'm not going to go into detail at this point because I want to move on to our, give our, uh, our presenter as much time as possible. I will, however, ask you to note January 24th at 12.30. Not all the times are posted here yet or the rooms because there's a little bit of flexibility there. But I can confirm, confirm that Stephanie Tong from Wayne State University who works on, she's a professor of communication. She has a lab working on social media and relationships. So uh, her presentation is entitled Social Media Relationships and Technology. So if you have ever ghosted someone, or been ghosted, or don't know what that means, come to this talk next semester. I think it's quite relevant uh, for all of us. Um, February 19th, a partnership with the College of Architecture and Design is bringing Laura Falano from the Illinois Institute of Technology to talk about design technology and the more than human. And Falano's background is in urban design and urban studies and policy. Um, she came to our attention when she wrote this, in my mind, really cool article on the politics of algorithms. So essentially what policy decisions are being baked into algorithms that do a lot of our kind of collective life today and what policies inform them. So that's why she, so that's um, how we, she came to our attention. Kenneth Nospel will be here March 21st from Georgia Tech. Um, his title is just so awesome and I won't say anything about it. Asimov, the Ice Moons of Saturn and New Humanities. So more to be, to be uh, come on that talk. And then finally, we have a panel on the eth ethics of autonomous vehicles. And we're trying to bring together is industry, public sector, and uh, philosophy. Um, kind of building off of the autonomous driving symposium, that was the presidential symposium this last fall, we wanted to really dig a little bit deeper into what are some of the ethical issues that under, underpin that. So you'll see these posters pop up around campus to mark the dates as uh, you see them and note them. We'll have more uh, publicity with the times and room numbers to come. Uh, and thank you all for your continued support and for attending these talks. I will now turn it over to one of the two Italian suits that's standing here, by the way, <laughs> Franco Globo, who is our speaker. So it's two Francos, too. I think there are not many Francos in the Midwest. <laughs> OK, it's a great pleasure for me, personally, to introduce Franco Pestilli. Franco is an assistant professor of psychological and brain science at Indiana University Bloomington. He's also associated with Indiana University's programs in cognitive science and neuroscience and holds a junk position at the Indiana University School of Optometry. Uh, Department of Computer Science and Intelligent System Engineering. Dr. Pastilli joined Indiana University in 2015 from Stanford University. Prior to that, he trained at New York University, Columbia University, and, and the Riken Brain Science Institute, Institute in Japan. Dr. Pastilli holds a PhD from New York University and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Yay! <laughs> He directs a, labo a laboratory, laboratory of computational neuroscience with research interests span human, um, human perception and cognition, brain plasticity, and neurodegeneration. Dr. Pastilli is director of the Advanced Computational Neuroscience Network 
and has active research projects spanning across network neuroscience and neuroinformatics. It's authored more than 40 scientific publications and his scientific work spans multiple fields of neuroscience with contributions to methods from mapping brain net networks, understanding human brain neuroanatomy uh, neuro and connectivity, as well as to clarifying fundamental aspects of human visual perception and cognition. Dr. Pastilli is elected fellow of the Association of Psychological Science and Psychonomics Society and has received both the Janet Taylor Spence Award for, for transformative early career achievements by the Association of Psychological Science as well as the e Easy Career Travel Award from the Japanese Neuroscience Society. This is a nice Easy Career Travel Award, I like it. Dr. Pestilli's scientific projects have been founded by the National Science Foundation, the, Indi the Indiana Clinical and Translational Institute, the Association for Psychological Science, the Indiana University, Emergent Areas of Research, per Pervasive Technology Institute of Microsoft Research. He is editorial board member for Brain Structure and Function and Natural Scientific Data, and routinely acts as editor for several journals among which PNAS and cognitive processing. Um, so it's just a stellar young researcher in psychology. Young, yeah, <laughs> we're still young. Uh, but he's also a good friend, an old friend of mine. We studied together in Rome. I still remember the times of uh, our uh, artificial intelligence exams. And uh, we spent a lot of nice time in a wonderful city that was Rome in the time of our um, uh, studies. Uh, we traveled together to uh, Croatia uh, with a motorbike, a very old motorbike that broke during the trip. And so we found a place in uh, Trieste, I believe, in which to uh, you know, solve the problem. But there was a very terrible sound for all the trip. Uh, and close to Florence, we were almost you know, uh, just being abandoned in the highway by our wonderful motorbike. Uh, so it, it was a great experience, and then uh, uh, he left. Just uh, he disappeared because he wanted more, probably. And then he, he went to NYU, and I was always, you know, uh, keeping track of what he, he, he was doing. And it was just a, uh, an incredible career. And then we met again in a, in a, at the Brain Science Institute in, in the Riken Institute in, in in Japan. It was very nice to meet there again. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's wonderful that we are still in touch and that we are just maybe 400 miles apart after uh, this long experience together in, uh, in Rome. So it's a, it's a personal big pleasure to have him here. And uh, I'm honored that, he, that he's here with us. And uh, I think this is going to be a wonderful talk. Thank you, Frank. Okay, can you hear me? Great, thank you very much. It, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It, uh, I'm obviously humbled by uh, the large extent of the presentation. And uh, yeah, Franco and I lost each other for several years and uh, then found each other again in Tokyo, which is not, a, uh, not an easy thing to do, uh, to find a friend in Tokyo. And um, uh, I had to say, yeah, we probably are the two only Francos in the Midwest. <laughs> he, he can claim to be the oldest and longest living Franco in the Midwest. I'm not completely sure that I'm older than you. <laughs> 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 okay, anyway, thank you very much. So I, I, I will talk today about a project that we have started at Indiana University about, um, about a year, a year and a half ago now. It's funded uh, through the Brain Initiative, uh, through NSF, and uh, it's called Brain Life, and it's a platform. And about a year ago, actually, I reached out to Lior and Franco. I actually know Lior pretty well, because we met through some of the big data, NSF big data program uh, meetings that we were organized. I'm lead, uh, I mean, one of the director of the big data uh, neuroscience spoke for the big data hub and I met uh, Lior early on, and I loved his energy, and I kind of followed up on him later, and I started saying, oh, why don't we do something together? Why don't we do here? And I had an idea that what I'll present today could be a, potentially a new way to connect 
across institutions and campuses and maybe develop for the first time a way of doing education uh, in a field that actually it's not on a campus, it's on a different campus, right? So neuroscience, it's at Bloomington, data is in Bloomington, but you guys have engineering here, you guys have uh, computer science. Do you have a data science uh, initiative or, or motion? Many of the university do. So I had this idea, why don't we use the platform to establish connections for teaching and education because there's a lot of sharing that can happen through the cloud. So before that, I'm gonna, I, I hope there's some engineers in the room. This slide is for the engineers in the room. How many of you do not know Moore's Law? You can raise your hand, it's okay, it's okay. So Moore's Law was actually uh, uh, discovered by uh, one of the founders of Intel, I believe, and uh, the fact that over, uh, about every two years, the number of chips on a, on a, on a, on a CPU of a computer doubles, right, and the price halves. Right? That's the law which is plotted here. It's the law that have made you know, computers faster, have moved us from slow computers on a green screen to clouds and big computers and big processing. Right? And uh, it's fundamental. It turns out that, that Moore's law kind of broke at a certain point because the chips to have more and more uh, transistors had to become so small and the transistor to become so close to each other that quantum physics started mattering, right? And that because of that, we had to stop making chips smaller and we had to go to different architectures. So it turns out today's hardware uh, that uses parallel architectures on multiple chips instead of a single chip with multiple transistors. And, um, and, and that actually it, it has brought us to uh, hardware like this one. This is uh, at one of the clusters at, at IU that we use for the research that powers the, 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 the platform that you will see is one of them. And these allow us to do calculations at high speed and in quick time, storage large amount of, the, uh, of data. And they're fundamental. Their architecture is parallel, meaning there are many distributed uh, systems for computing that get together through connectivity. And there's another thing that works that way, the human brain. This is a kind of oldish picture of the human brain, the way we used to look at the brain. Uh, this is what actually, uh, I don't know how many of you have thought about the brain. This is what, that, that's the three pounds of stuff that makes you who you are, right? It's like, it looks like jello, right? But it actually tends to be quite important. And, uh, and the computing power of that piece of jello, it's, uh, it's impressive and can't quite be compared yet to any of the computers we have. The brain is also organized um, as, a, as a big computer. So we used to think about the brain as a single computer with a CPU, memory, long-term long storage. Now we don't do that anymore. We think about the brain as the internet. Okay? We think about the brain as being a coordinated action of computers in different locations, right? It's not geographical locations, it's brain locations, but there's computers uh, all over. Okay, here, this is, a, this is a stain for cell body, right? So the darker the stain, the more purple, right? The more cell bodies, right? These are neuronal cell bodies, and the neuronal cell bodies roughly, you know, with a thousand uh, miles zoom out, can be thought of as the computing of these neurons, where that's where computing happens. Now, in the lighter part of the staining, that's where the cables are. Uh, the cables are light because they have cell, left cell body, they're actually, uh, it's mostly fat. It's a little sheet of myelin that wraps cable that fills up that uh, structure with a lipid. Right? And that lipid, uh, it's really important, turns out, to the way we function, the way the internet functions, right? So I always make the metaphor, think about some people having copper, some people having fiber optic, okay? And imagine getting some kids to develop fiber optic for communication, but starting from copper. That's what happens to many of us as we develop during the years. And uh, how many of you still remember a modem? Yeah, this this, this will, will, will fade at a certain point. Modem was that device that we used to connect to the internet and it would make all these 
weird noise, etc. Like, imagine doing what I'm doing or what I just did today. You, I, I copy a 200 megabyte, 200 megabyte presentation between computers this way, right? And with the modern, that would never be possible. With uh, the brain, as much as the internet, as much as computers, uh, they need connectivity. Okay? You can have the most powerful computers on your desk unless you're connected to other people, to other researchers, to other institutions. Nowadays, you just are limited to what you can do. And that is the same for the brain. There's brain area that do vision, there's brain area that do motor, and they need to constantly integrate information and communicate with each other so that we can function. Cables. Well, so these cables, turns out, are organized into networks. And I don't know how many of you that, that if there's one thing I like to remember about neuroscience in the last 10 years is that we move from thinking about neuroscience as the brain being made by little pieces of area that do things to networks of areas that do things. And that change, that theoretical insight, actually was born in Bloomington, Indiana, by my colleague Olaf Sparms. So how do we measure brain networks? So this is a little bit about what we do in the lab, and then I'll get you actually on what you want. we came here to do. So this is a, a, a blunt dissection. You know, people are pretty good at doing this, in which you, like archaeology, brush off dust from, uh, uh, from old utensils that might have been found in a, in a site. Uh, neuro, some neuro, neurosurgeons are really good at brushing off pieces of tissue or this jello so that they can expose fibers the connectivity, the highways of the brain, the large connection fibers. And they have names. Over the years, they've been assigning names to these fibers, uh, the inferior longitudinal fascicles, connecting vision to memory, right? The cingulum, memory to decision making, uh, anterior thalamic radiation, subcortical to decision making areas, motor cortex to the spinal cord. All these structures, or many of them, at least 30 of them or more, we know and we can do and we can study using these uh, methods in which you take a, you know, a dead brain and work on it in different ways. Now, over the last 15 years, we actually moved to modern technology that, like MRI, we have one of these machines in Bloomington and we collect data like, uh, uh, like the one I'm gonna show you next. And the, the, the great deal here is that by taking these machines, we actually can map the same highways uh, in living brains. Okay, that's my brain. I'm still talking. Uh, and you can look at me, how I will age over the next year. I, 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 I tell you, I will age over the next years. That's happening already. I just got glasses. Okay. Now, uh, what, what do we do? How do we measure this? Well, it turns out, I, I introduced that before, uh, the fibers, the neuronal fiber connecting different areas of the brain are organized like small cannulas. Right? These are the axons of the neurons. Think about a neuron as a tree that has canopies in the air, roots in the ground, and there's a trunk. And that trunk is just like a straw. Okay? That straw has wraps of myelin around it. Okay? And we can calibrate the way we measure with the scanner so that we can measure water diffusion within that little straw. Okay, so think about water diffusing in a structure like that. There's more water allowed to diffuse along the straws, right? And the, the water diffusion against the straw is compressed or reduced, right? And that's what we measure in the, in the MRI measurements that we do, which is called diffusion-weighted MRI, okay? And we measure that in different locations in the brain, and then we, we use Computing, computer science. We literally use computer science and engineering algorithms to sew them together, all these measurements, so that we can reconstruct computationally you know, long-range connections and build networks out of them. So these are examples of some of my brain structures. Right? And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm pressing about that. So this is one connection. This is how it looks. They're beautiful. I like them. So I make movies of them. I actually have one of my students now studying the shape of them. You know, I'm taking uh, computational geometry algorithms from computer science and computer graphics and trying to understand variability in these shapes across populations of individuals. I found that fascinating. We don't know that. But uh, the other thing we can do, we can take one of these and look now at the properties of the tissue within the structure. 
So this is a motor structure, connects motor cortex to the spinal cord, right? And what I'm doing here, I'm plotting from one to 100, fractional anisotropy, which means how organized, tied together, packed together, are the fibers of the neurons within that structure. Are they dense, non-dense, disorganized, and kind of all crossing each other, or they're all nice and smoothly going together? And uh, you know, this, each one of the line is a subject, and this is the left corticospinal tract, and this is the right corticospinal tract. And you see, for example, this individual has kind of a distribution of values that is a little bit away from the rest. So we can take a look at that right, and see whether he needs help. Actually, with this type of measurements over the last year, we understand that uh, there's a, a large variability between us in the properties of the cables that connect the brain, okay? As I said before, turns out some of us are born with copper, some of us are born with, uh, my, uh, with uh, fiber optic, and then through education and through learning, we kind of all become the society we are. And in fact, you know, this cable are involved in cognition, attention, uh, language, memory, reading, and they are really important in the developmental and aging process. Actually, during aging and during the developmental, the first 10 years of your life, the majority of the changes are not just happening in the cell bodies, but they're also happening in these cables that I'm talking about today. So that's what we do in the lab. And obviously, brain measurements can happen at many different scales, because we have a lot of technology to measure data out of brains. So here, it's a famous figure that was updated in 2014. And this is time, all the scales of time in which we can measure. So we go from months and years to milliseconds. And this is scale of space. You know, we go from as small as a synapse, single connection between two neurons, all the way to brains. You know? And actually, some of the data sets I handle have thousands of brains. All these measurements give you different insights about the brain. So it's not just about the size of the data, but it's also about what you can see out of, in the brain processing out of these measurements. But also, turns out, uh, you can go beyond measurements in the brain. You can connect the measurements in the brain with the measurements of behavior of the individual and how the individual sits within networks of uh, families, networks of friends, and society in general. And, and this is it quite unexplored, the relation between your individuality as a biological system and our environment and society. Okay, over the last years, there's been a push in neuroscience. Of, we, we understand that to understand a complex system like the brain, we cannot do these sort of experiments in which we're just sitting in a lab and kind of cutting off parts of the brain and looking at it. That was fundamental early on. But the next generation has to go big. Right? We have to start pulling data, collecting lots of data at different scales with different modalities to get lots of insight and find convergent evidence from multimodal multi data. Okay? And there's been lots of projects over the last 15, 20 years that push the idea that we need to start collecting data and sharing data to understanding and clarifying how the brain works and health. So one very famous connectome uh, project, sorry, is called the Human Connectome Project. You might have heard about it. It's about 1,200 brains. That was the initial project. Now there's several spin-offs of it. It's, uh, the data are based in St. Louis, Missouri, even though this is a national collaboration and there's a lot of efforts from Minnesota in, the, in developing technology for data acquisition. You might have heard of the ADNI, currently based, most of the data is based in USC, University of Southern California, and they have about 1,000, 1,100 uh, uh, data sets collected over 10, 15 years. But there's actually bigger data sets coming up. This is a, a, a data set, it's called the ABCD Brain Project, okay? It's, a, it's a just released, uh, the first batch of data, it's a national, project funded by an NIH, and they will have about uh, 10,000 adolescent kids 
right, tracked over the years with multi-dimensions or their behavior, their schooling, their level of understanding of society success, and also we will track their biological tissue uh, over time. The other one, one of the most impressive one, is actually the, the UK Biobank. The UK Biobank has a total of more than half a million individuals, okay, that uh, in a place where there's a public health uh, systems, they just simply agreed to share their data for, res for research purposes. They simply sign off an IRB, and then now all the public, all their records are public, and hundreds of thousands of them will participate in brain scans. Six brain scans times 100,000. Like the first time I saw this one, I thought, oh my, what am I going to do here? I'm going to download the data? Right? 600 times about a gigabyte per file. That's what we're talking about. Now, all this push really can be simplified, I like to think about it, as we've been moving from Brain picture, that's what neuroscience used to be, brain pictures and understanding through brain pictures, uh, to brain bites, okay? And that, it's fundamental, and it actually requires a lot of changing and gearing and changing in education, changing in the way we do science, changing in the way we think about uh, the modeling and understanding of the brain. Uh, digital data goes to scale. Right? Going to scale means that whereas before we used to decide on a single slice, on a single specimen in front of us, now we need to do statistics, now we need to use computer science modeling, now we need to use algorithms, okay, lots of physics algorithm in, the, in what I showed you before. So it's a really big change. There has to be a lot of injections of knowledge from different disciplines into neuroscience to bring us to uh, the, next, the next generation. And also, uh, that, that I told you before, actually there's a lot of way, not just data is different, there's a lot of model and modeling that happens to model the data. And all these models are different, easy, hard, better, worst, and they provide different insights on structure of the brain and function of the brain. So let me actually somehow, yeah, let me move here. Uh, so these are two examples to give you the idea. This is a single data set that I s mapped for the cortical spinal tract, connections between mother cortex and the spinal cord, and the arcuate fascicles, the blue one, that connects you know, your speech production to your speech understanding parts of the brain, pretty important. And I, I, I run the algorithm to map the two, and I got this shape. Then I use the same data set in the same subject, same resolution, same SNR, and I run a different algorithm, and I got that shape, very different shapes. And that's actually what stopped me in 2011 and, uh, from trying to understand the brain and move more and more to our computational methods for developing these methods further. So all this change really brings uh, lots of meat on the bench of neuroscience, right? Lots of digital meat. And uh, because of that, I started early on realizing that we need to change the way we train our students. We need to change the way uh, we attract talent to neuroscience. Uh, we need to change the way we think about computing. Think about downloading 600,000 one gigabyte files on a laptop, right? And try to analyze that. Right? We need to change the way we think about the infrastructure we need for computing. Is it just desktop in a lab, or do we need to move the lab somewhere that it's consistent? How do we not lose data? Right? And now that we have a half a million brains in a lab somewhere in Norway, right? how do we think about making statements, scientific statements? Yes, no, I believe this, I don't believe this. That's a different, completely different question than just a, a slice in front of your in front of your eyes, right? And uh, at the same time, to really get to the big questions, you need big data, and to really get to big data, you need to share, which is not what traditionally neuroscientists uh, have done, because we were trained in small labs with just few data, very rare and precious data that will make our career, right? So there's a lot of change in, uh, in culture that has to happen so that people become open to sharing. And that's the only 
way we can bring the transdisciplinary uh, uh, that we need, uh, expertise we need, so that we can address these problems. The goal, try to understand. One of the major push in the US in these days is trying to understand neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease, right? Because we have an aging population and we will need to understand how to take care of them when we, you know, the younger ones would be less than the older ones. So in 2015, uh, 15, uh, 16, no, in 2017, no, we started this project uh, called Brain Life. The project uh, has different goals, but majorly has the goal of promoting mechanism for engagement of multi different disciplines like computer science, engineering, as much as psychology and neuroscience, uh, to try to use, understand uh, brain data. Okay? Or in a certain way, use brain data as one of the many examples that can be used for developing algorithms, developing better methods for computing. So the goals of the projects are to engage multiple communities of researchers, computer scientists as much as neuroscientists, take data from small lab all around the globe and redistribute them for different purposes to other people. Right? I literally want to give my data to Lior, and I want Lior to compute on it, to like write an algorithm for image detection or something that you know, he knows how to do and not my graduate students. Right? And then promote share of data and algorithms. So I want to take the algorithm Lior develops on my data and now use it routinely for my publications right? and cite him back. The way we think this can happen is by having a cloud system and a platform where you can share uh, products, assets of research. Data, that's an asset of research. Algorithms, that's an asset of research, etc. And to do that, you need seamless access to computing. And that's what Brain Life does for you, among the other things. You know, it's, a, uh, it's attached to some supercomputers today, and uh, it provides free storage and computing for researchers like us. So we have, when we wrote the grant, we had about 66 collaborators, and you know, Lior was one of them, and people uh, interested in potentially evaluating uh, the platform and suggesting changes, but also using uh, downloading data and using the data, or maybe submitting an algorithm. Now, you've been hearing me, right? Every time we talk about uh, what's happening in neuroscience, we talk about data, computing, and algorithms for computing, okay? So uh, I like to think about what we do in neuroscience on a day-by-day -day basis in this space, right? Every time we analyze data, we have some data, we have some analysis method, and we have some compute device. Could be your laptop, hopefully not, uh, or could be a, a cluster, okay? And one experiment to understand the brain is always a node at the, inter at the intersection among all these planes, okay? That's the only way the three things, everything can come together to do an experiment. And not all the communities in science think about these axes the same way. Okay? In fact, NSF has actually completely different directorates dedicated to each one of them. Right? But this project has to bring all of them together to work on a similar data set, on a similar problem. So these are examples of algorithms that we run in the lab for understanding the brain. These are examples of clusters and machines that we use for computing in the lab. And every time you, they intersect with some analytics, they, you get an, an experiment. But now, think about my situation, your situation. We have labs, we have graduate students, we have undergraduate students, right? Psychology students, neuroscience students. What are we talking about when we're talking about bringing them to the modern era of data science, right? So I start with Dan, he, my graduate student. He came to my lab from philosophy, right? No computing skills. And I started worrying. You know, I was worried that he would graduate, get a PhD, and well, I was happy if we would, he will, and, but leave the lab with a computer full of code that he wrote that no one else can understand. 
and then that he analyzed paper, uh, data for papers that we published, and that I would lose track of all that. Right? I was worried. Sandra, it's a completely different story. She's a vision scientist. She's understanding, she's trying to understand how eye disease changes your brain, because it does, right? It turns out if you reduce inputs from your eyes to your brain, your brain tissue changes. And we don't understand why and how and to the extent to which that change permeates the rest of the brain and change your cognition. So she wanted to do it right. She wanted to understand the brain and use the right methods, right? But she was in a clinical hospital. She didn't really have the expertise around her. So she came to my lab and learned for a couple of months, and we collaborated. And I had to spend a lot of time installing code for her, training her how to do that, using the code, and when you make mistakes, etc. Marta is the opposite. Marta, it, it's a, she's a smart cookie. She actually unfortunately went back to Canada. She was my colleague at IU, and uh, she's a computer scientist, machine learning. I want to use what Marta uses and develops to accelerate my research, to do faster, right? So I want to work with Marta, but she has never seen a brain. She has never seen a file of a data from the brain, okay? So how do I do that interaction? Lior, Lior has a lot of students here, and these students uh, could contribute to algorithms, right, and to image processing for brain data. But he doesn't have access to m machines to collect data, and he can do that by collaborating one at a time, or hopefully, you know, we'll do it on the cloud. Conchata is studying Alzheimer, same thing. She's in a hospital, she wants to do it right, she wants to understand. And then there's me, right? And I interact with all these individuals and I do what I can and I need to keep track of a lot of stuff. Literally, I need to keep track of a lot of stuff. Are you using the right data when you are in Bloomington and when you go back to Lawrence, right? Are you using the same version of the code or sadly your computer is different and the code doesn't run, which is number one problem and about 30% of the time, lots of graduate students have to spend. It's like in investing time in installing code and keep it track of code versions. So in every one of these, there's data involved, computing involved, algorithms. So brain life, uh, it's meant to offer an public access to supercomputers where people like Marta and Liar can come and publish, we call it register, code, that acts on data through the platform. So we develop a specification, you know, and how to do this, right? So that if you have something that you think, oh, I think it works for your data and I can try it, uh, you can come and you can publish and it will, will be digested by the platform and work on the platform. And uh, there's people like me, my lab, and then other colleagues or you know, uh, uh, Conchetta or people like Sandra, they have data and they want to use the right algorithms in the right way. So they come and can put data on the platform and the platform digests the data and makes the data interoperable with every app algorithms that is published on the, on the platform. And there's another dimension to this. If you work in the business of building hardware, and if you think you built a very fast computer, you can also plug in the computer on the platform and show impact of your new architecture by showing how many people have been using it, what type of discoveries have done by using your hardware, et cetera. What Brain Life does takes all these assets, the data, the code, and the computing, and gets, connects them. And uh, you know, can take data from different repositories of open data that are out there, or you can upload your own data. And uh, all the code and the code versioning is handled through GitHub. GitHub is the major platform uh, for code versioning. It's on the cloud for our like, like, like. And uh, you can use it. And you can take a snippet of code that are published on GitHub and run them on Brain Life, and they will do something on data on Brain Life. Uh, if you're using clouds, raw code, it's not enough, you actually need to do what is called containerization, which is a small abstraction of the code that lets you run code independently of the OS. So Brain Life also handles Docker and Singularity. These are the two major technology for doing that. So that we allow computing on HPC clusters, uh, like we have a bunch of IU that we can access, or uh, clouds. And we have a Jetstream cloud, which is a national cloud, the first national cloud uh, 
public that was funded by NSF. Turns out it's at, a, it's at, a, it's at IU. Um, we're also using Azure, and actually last month we got a, a new award from Google, so we also compute on Google's. And as we generate analyses, as we use data, we generate what we call data derivatives, right? And data derivatives are stored somewhere and they're reusable uh, by other researchers, so if you like to share them. So this is kind of the architecture I'm happy to talk about uh, anyone. The only thing I want to say here is that we spend a lot of time, this is a research project, right? And cloud computing is expensive. So we spent a lot of time making sure that the platform will not die as my three years of award will die. And the way we did that, the way we're hoping we will do this, is by not buying in in a single cloud provider, okay? So we started from Jetstream, we added Azure, we're working with Google, right? And maybe later you guys will buy a cluster and you guys want your student to compute for classes on the cluster, right? So you can add your cluster if you want. And the way we did that, we're, we, we developed technology that can take data from one place, ship it another place, move the computing next to it and do the computing and then flush everything and get the results out. That's called Amaredi. And the warehouse is what you'll see next. But think about it. Because of this architecture, researchers like Marta and Liar can come and uh, get contribution to the platform and to the environment. And uh, Sandra and Conchetta can benefit from that contribution, but can give back to the community by providing data that my Liar might not have access to. So people can come to analyze data, or people can come to get credit for good code or for good data that they shared. They can reuse data. and. Uh, Another mechanism which I don't cover today, you can publish everything you do on this platform, okay? So, by the way, the platform was developed by this team, Dan, Lindsay, Brent, Bradley. These are all graduate students, okay? So Ichi, he's the gearhead behind it. He's the developer in the lab, right? So he's doing most of the actual development. So all together we work. Kate, unfortunately we lost Kate. She was here until November or something. She moved on to a, to a company. And Steve actually started as a high school student, but Steve is a special one. He, he finished college in two years now and he's moving on with his life, okay? And he started working with us as he was still a, graduate, uh, a high school student. So the, the platform allows data analysis and visualization, upcycling code and publishing. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about this, uh, if you don't mind. This is the moment in which I'm gonna show you the platform. I hope it works. Okay, here we are. So this is the landing page of BrainLive, which you've been seeing. There's some information here that you can read. Uh, actually, what I wanna point out, there's documentation that we have down here. You can go and read the documentation. And this is how the platform looks uh, when you log in. These are the apps. Actually, this is before logging in. I'm not signing up yet. These are the apps. So apps is this abstraction. It's a software object. It's an abstraction for code, okay? And they look like, I, I, I really think some of these companies out there like Amazon and Google have done some good. Okay, they developed some uh, entities that we're very familiar with. You go on Amazon, you find these little cards, and you go on Google Play Store and you find these little cards, and they look similar here. But the card is really just an object that contains information about uh, what this uh, code is supposed to do, um, uh, what are the inputs here, what are the outputs, who developed and contributed to it. We actually keep track of execution, you know, how many times it was used, who used it, where it used it. We grab from GitHub the readme file, right? So the information about how to use the code and how to develop. Now, you've seen here, I went from here, the card, I click, one click, second click, I'm gonna click here. That's the code on GitHub. Right? Now, this is not my platform, right? This is the actual code that we grab on the fly and compute with, right? And you can go back and look at it and read it, understand it, etc. So two, two clicks away from your actual code. We keep track of versions, and what's actually something very interesting and very important to me, every of the assets that you contribute to the platform gets a DOI. And a DOI, 
digital object identifier, it's citable. Okay, it's another way to get credit for what you're doing. And uh, okay, here now I'm on a different page. You can see these, these are private projects. You know, people can create private project, put data there and put apps, or people can use uh, available public projects and data sets. Okay, this is a public project that I'm inside. It's called O3D. We're just in revision now for the first publication. We computed about 2,700 data sets. We have 12 subjects. I think it's about 1.8 terabyte of data that we generated through the platform. And, um, and these data sets are organized again as objects. They are visually simple. Uh, but they have a lot of details behind it. So I'm going to open one of these. So here is, it is. This one is actually tells you the app that produced the object, and it tells you where the object is saved. It's on a cluster at IU in this case. It gives you some visual feedback on the quality of the object. I can tell you this is the number of individual streamlines, fibers, right? identify for major highways in the brain. There's about 20 major highways, and there's some of them have 6,000, some of them have you know, hundreds of streamlines. So all this information is stored. You have provenance of how the file was generated, and you have apps that are relevant to the file. The apps that can digest the file and do processing on the file. It's all kept, and you can trash it, don't and you can look at it, or you can compute with it or download it, okay? And uh, I'm gonna show you how this file looks. So I'm gonna click here, and then I can open either files or a browser for the anatomy. I'm gonna browse the anatomy. I already opened it before as we were setting up the computers. That's how that file looks, okay? It's a, it's a brain, and uh, there's the highways are there, and you can look at a few of them individually or in tandem, and, and it's, it's a matter of quality control, right? As we do this computing, everything is on the cloud, everything is all computational intensive and statistically inclined, and, but at the end of the day, we're neuroscientists, we need to look at the brain and see whether what we compute made sense. So this is one way to do it. You can look at highways. Oh, this one disconnected. Let's see if this opens again. Or you can look at other files that show you cortex. This one, this one, this one. Let's see how long it takes. It's downloading now, so what's, this is happening. There's, there's a file somewhere, maybe on Azure or a TAC supercomputing center that is being shipped to a computer in my lab where I have a good GPU, and that's where I do some of the visualization because you know this is now all loading the data that were processed on the platform, and some of the data are 3D meshes, so they need GPU computing to be fast, and hopefully the meshes will show up soon. This is, by the way, it's Harvard software. The other one we developed, but this one is a major software in neuroscience that everyone uses. The way we do, we do cloud side visualization, so we don't have to download the data on this computer, right? We keep the data on the cloud, right? And we allow visualization interaction. You, you don't do analysis here. You just kind of look at whether the result seems reasonable. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. So you've seen how many things and many moving parts, right, that will require engineers, computer scientists, psychologists that are interested in the brain, and neuroscientists to work together so that we can uh, do the computing we do, the analysis we want to do, uh, use the software and the infrastructure for hardware we need, and then change the way, do, the way we do statistics and think about statistics, and we need to share. It's uh, not the moment this now of keeping code on your laptop or on your de desktop anymore. Share it, have an impact with it. Have other people use it, which require changes in the way you write it, because I need to understand it, right? We cannot write code that is just for you. So the goal here, and before I went one too many, the goal here is to also think about that if we do this right, we might be lowering barriers, right, to, uh, uh, it's all open. So in a certain way, we're lowering barriers of entries for students that might not have access uh, to this type of data, to this type of computing. Okay. And uh, oh, obviously this kicked in. Let me see where it is. 
block. Okay, so lowering the barriers of entry to uh, neuroscience uh, education or to computer science applications and impact, it's a part of what the, the project wants to do. That means that your students here could access the platform, right? And instead of developing maybe on some small data sets on a computer here, they could develop an algorithm that is resilient, robust, by testing it on data that actually matters for other communities, like in the medical school. Okay, so that, and now students that might have less access to compute facilities or measurements devices can sadly contribute to understanding the brain. That's my vision. Now, we don't necessarily all like everything about cloud platforms, right? You, you might have seen this, right? And uh, this was a major problem. And uh, obviously, I'm not here to say everything you do on the cloud is great. Obviously, there's things that are coming out of these major platforms that are not great, not just great. Uh, but there are definitely some success models by using cloud platforms, okay? Now, we, are we going to be able, in the next generation of education, to leverage these technologies for advancing education, bringing our students to be uh, data science and cloud uh, literate so that they can get jobs to these companies where there's a lot of jobs. Psychologists, I want my students because not all of my students, unfortunately, we get a job as a faculty. I want my students to get a job at Microsoft, at Google. So I get, I get them started early. First year graduate school, they start computing on Google. They start talking with a developer, okay? And they start working in a team. They're not isolated in a, on a desk in a dark room doing whatever they feel they should be doing with me, right? They are working in a team. And working in a team is what is necessary later on in your life, but it's necessary in the majority of the companies. So that's one change in education that we can do now, right? Bring team, they can be distributed geographically or not, working together, right? So normally, you know, a teacher teaches something to a student in a classroom, the student gets something out of that classroom. That's great, that's worked. But what if that classroom could be the cloud? Right? Or better, what if that classroom could benefit from the cloud? I, if, I was invited for a talk similar to this in Ohio and Columbus some time ago. And I like driving there, it was kind of not, not the best experience driving on 70s during a work day that's full of trucks and everything. And, 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 and when I arrived there, it was all these beautiful people, like people I really would like to talk to. And then I realized that in a certain way, the Midwest, it's a spread out version of Boston. And that's a barrier, right? Every, like we are about the same amount of people here just that the year is very wide than Boston, right? Boston has done pretty well. Not because they're smarter, sorry. Maybe they are, right? I think it's because they are together, right? So how can we break that barrier too, right? What type of technology we need to connect people across this geographical spread? Obviously train, don't tell me train, okay? Oh, yes, if we had a train, it would be different. We don't have a train, okay? But we have clouds, we have software, we have video conferencing. We have a lot of things we can do together. And uh, I think Brain Life could be one of those things that can help us uh, uh, work together. Thank you, and I want to thank all my collaborators and funding. Quite a simple question. You mentioned that uh, if you're, you have uh, sight impaired, your brain will shrink. Will Is change, it, yes. Will change. Is it also the opposite? If you see more, will your brain expand and grow wiser? And so it actually, it's a very active question. And the, yes, in general, yes. It, it doesn't shrink and grow. That's not what we're thinking. It changes. Changes the connectivity, yeah. And there's actually a couple of very interesting papers that came out in science this month 
showing that very quickly as you learn something, the brain cables change as much as the computers, right? It's not just about learning algorithms, making those algorithms into practice by connecting them with the right people or neurons in the brain's case. Thank you. So uh, the ambition and scale of your project is really impressive. Um, so what I was wondering about is replication, and I wonder if um, anyone is using or planning to use your platform to replicate experiments. Thank you. So we are, and uh, so we're writing a paper now describing the platform and the technology, and part of the paper is to show that you can come and generate meaningful scientific results over and over. Okay, that's one form of replication. It's mm -hmm. not right. It's not reproducibility fully. Right now, I have other labs that are trying to come to the platform to replicate other experiments. Okay, we have one abstract that we're sending out next week. And oh, yeah, so that's part of it. And I show you very briefly. I didn't push you enough about. One of the goals of the platform was to support reproducibility in science. Okay, that's what NSF really liked. And we have all the mechanism for tracking code version, data versions, right? And publishing means, means preserved. It. So uh, the paper that we have in revision now actually talks about the publishing mechanism, which I didn't talk to you guys. The publishing mechanism is, imagine you come with your graduate student and do a bunch of analysis on some data and now you get a page like uh, I'll go back to the to the to the to the platform actually. So in this project here, you still see it? Yeah. So I'm going to zoom out, zoom in a little bit more. Do you see? This is the detail of the project. The project has some information about the data sets, the licenses that you need, the people that contributed to it. There's the data sets and publications. Okay, so the same data sets can be used for multiple publications. And we developed this concept of publication with, I really, um, it's um, close to my heart, I'm pushing hard on this, I think it's important. Uh, normally we publish a paper. And then some of us are good and put some code on GitHub. Some of us are good and put some data somewhere, mm, okay. But with Brain Life, you can actually generate a publication like this one, I'm gonna go on it now. Here, this is the first, and there's several coming, uh, in which in a single page with a single DOI, you get all the assets of research you generated. Okay? Here you have all the data sets generated that you can download either through common line or through the web. Common line is obviously better because there's a lot of data here. And all the apps that were used, all the code, it's preserved. The way we do it, we actually move the data from hot disk and hard drives to a, a preservation system that is replicated between two different CDs and has 10 years of preservation. It's all snapshot and so And you can replicate. So for each one of these data sets, you can open it and you can see the provenance. This is how that data set was generated, right? So it started from uh, a data set called HPC, so we're actually using the human connectome data as a start. We, we then run this split shell version 1.2 with those parameters, okay? So for every app that we use, we report the version of the app, the parameters, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So yeah, the replication was part of the, of the mandate of the grant and uh, very important. Back and then up to you. Yep. Hi. Um, this, this is very impressive. Um, my question is I love how you said that when inviting individuals into this cloud and writing um, research, it needs to change how it's written. Um, and I talk about this a lot, you know, in, in my work. Um, how, you know, working with individuals is important to be jargon free is what I'm saying. So, but understanding the linguistics of academia um, and how jargon is a big part of it. 
um, how are how will you or how have you encouraged researchers to be a part of this? How they need to change, you know, how they present their research if it's going to be for not just public consumption but public application. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, you're talking, you're telling me that there's a community of researcher that I haven't thought about, right? Researcher that will help and contribute by helping people understand each other, right? And clarify that. So uh, I'm seeing this as a grassroots, bottom-up process. People will have to come here and figure it out, right? And uh, people that will have success on the platform will be the one that write code that is simple and understandable. And we keep track of code usage, right? We have statistics for who used that data set, how many times, where it was used, and we give back. Actually, the platform doesn't quite yet do that, but it will it's in the uh, in second quarter of 2019. Give back statistics for your assets, right? We'll provide you some feedback. So I'm hoping this will kind of self-regulate. People will learn, because that's what happens in my lab, right? People came in with psychology idea or neuroscience idea, and suddenly they had to talk to me and so each. Right? And I said, well, what do you really mean? Okay, well, how would you write code to do it? Like, let's try it, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm seeing this as a bottom up more than a top down. But there's a tendency in the field to actually try to define standards, standards for si uh, from code and, um, and uh, data file saving and storage, standards that are human readable, but machine readable also. It's challenging, I'm helping, I'm contributing, but I don't want to lead that effort, it's complicated. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so you speak of a community of researchers, and you're interested in eliminating the um, barriers to education. And there seems to be an assumption of eagerness to collaborate. I remember Isaac Newton, who actually wrote in code precisely so that no one else could see his material. And I think of Newton and Leibniz in a bitter debate over who deserved to get credit for calculus, right? So you seem to be talking about scholars who no longer are driven by ego, who no longer are obsessed with credit for what they've come up with, Instead, it's like we have become neurons in a single brain, all working in the same enterprise, right? Um, in fact, as, as I watch your presentation, it occurs to me, you were talking about um, the study of the brain, but the brain becomes actually the paradigm for the community, for the community of scholars. Does this make sense? Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Um, it occurs to me that um, if individual, hmm, how do I put this? If individuals don't get credit anymore for their own um, insights, they also don't bear ethical responsibility. Ethical responsibility becomes something that's communal, that's general, it's, it's diffuse. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, total sense. And this is a very serious matter. And uh, so we are actually finalizing a paper called From I Science to Team Science. From I Science to Team Science. That's the paradigm shift I agree with you we need to have. But there's more complicated ramification of this, right? In psychology, for example, and in the humanities even more, if you don't publish alone, you don't publish. Right? How do you get tenure to people if they start working? Because many of people will collaborate here, will publish papers together. Right? In physics, it's the opposite. In physics, the paper is shorter than the list of authors, many times, right? But everyone, knows that to understand and attack big problems, you have to do that. So I agree, there's a change in culture that has to happen at the academic level. You know what I'm betting on is the graduate students. I'm betting on the graduate students. I'm hoping it doesn't happen. Oh, you're hoping it doesn't happen. I like that challenge. OK, why, why would you hope that? Well, I, I would hope that because um, I, I don't want us to all be simple neurons working in the same project. I want us to be skeptical and resistant, suspicious of each other. I, I want a culture based on debate. And uh, I tell you, my students debate a lot in the lab, even though they're helping each other constantly. So the, the debates are not going away. It's not all smiles, right? Everyone fears public 
publication, making something public, right? It's, it's a scary thing, right? So the debates continues in my lab and I can be continuing with my collaborators. I still Skype with my collaborators, so that's not going away. The egos should go away, especially in academia and education. I'm a public employee, that's how I define, I'm, I'm an employee of Indiana University. And I, in a certain way, what I do should go back to society as quickly as possible. Keeping it on my desk in my yellow notebook, that's not good to society, okay? And what is the best way to share that as quickly as possible? I'll tell you another example, I might speak to this. Uh, that now that we had this mechanism, and all my students now are running projects here because we, it's useful for them and it's useful also for the project. And uh, what happens there is that every new graduate student, instead of having to reinvent the wheel, learns the wheel from the work of someone else and reuses that work quickly. I'm talking about weeks. So within weeks, I find bugs that another graduate student hasn't found, right? And several times I had to re-gear a project, restart the project of the previous graduate student because the new one had found the bug. I fear that without that, I would have published a couple of papers with bug in the code. And there's a lot of code in what we do in neuroimaging. So as other fields, a very simple code, just maybe an equation implemented. But for us, there's layers and layers and stacks of code that now they're constantly being debugged because they're community used. And people suddenly come with a new data set and it doesn't work. And they comment. You know, there's all this social commenting. So there's still criticisms and they're not going to go away. Okay. Thank you, Franco. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question is also about ethics, but from a slightly different angle. Um, so the, the humans, the, the people whose, um, brains, uh, who, whose brain information are kept here, collected here um, on the platform, um, I'm just wondering what kind of, so th th these are living people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm wondering what kind of um, information they're given about how their brain information will be used by researchers, um, especially if, you, if you're working with publicly accessible platforms in which you don't necessarily know um, how, or, or you can't really anticipate, right, all of the different projects that will be um, using this information. So how do you explain to people how their brain information will be used and how do you get consent from them um, for different projects that um, may not even be going now or that they may not know about or, or even if they know about, they may not understand, mm -hmm. right? So not, not all of your um, thousands of, of subjects are, are scientists. And so how do you explain to them how their information is used um, and how do you get consent from them? Yeah, so it's great. That's a great question. It's, a, it's, it's actually has become a research field right? because of what you just said. We don't know what this data will be useful for in 20 years. Right? Probably nothing, because we will have new data that is better. That's my guess, okay? Because it, unfortunately, data ages very quickly. But there's been a lot of proposal on how to do this, right? Different projects, uh, we actually, I was opening this page, we have data access policies on the platform, and normally those data access policies depend on the originators of the data, right? They, they must have established an IRB approval for sharing, right? Normally that goes institution by institutions. For public data sets, there's a very complicated phrasing for which the data can be reused, the derivative for the data. So uh, one thing you can do on the platform is not share the original data, but just share the derived data. So it's a little bit poorer but still very useful for geometrical computing or network science, et cetera, because of these type of concerns. So some researchers might come and don't want to do that. It's not genetic data, so it's not data that tells you 100% of who you are and how you are. Right? Also, so it's a complicated, there's no solution. There's things like open consent form that you can go online and there's a proposal of how to make a consent that is open and encompassing, but still prefer privacy. Europe is going the other way. So US is actually quite open toward openness, right? Whereas Europe, they're 
closing. They're really worried about privacy, and they're really worried about what might happen to this data. So they're, in a certain way, setting up legal barriers to usage of data. So th this, is a, this is important, and you know, that's why uh, we also have private project that you can handle. You can share different parts of the data. Uh, it's a very interesting ethics component that will be developed as these platforms come up. This is not the only platform. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Franco. Um, you know that we, we are really interested in uh, inclusive excellence here at, in, at Lawrence Tech, right? So we want to involve in research and education more and more people that are historically uh, underserved. And uh, I think these kind of platforms are great, serve greatly this kind of, uh, let's say, democratization of knowledge. Um, but at the same time, I'm a little bit afraid that this is not applicable or not easily ap applicable to different contexts. Uh, for example, we were mentioning before, you were mentioning the fact that in, in the humanities, uh, it's more difficult to share because we have only one author and people have ideas that want, or in philosophy, they want to uh, actually demonstrate that their idea is the best idea or something. Uh, in science, this is kind of different. Uh, so my question for you is, how do you think that this kind of uh, new context um, is going to be applicable to different fields of knowledge in STEM and non-STEM contexts? Well, it's related to the changing culture, the need in changing culture that we were stuck talking about before. So I mean, I feel like more in the business of changing things to figure out what we need to do to change things than in the business of, oh, that we cannot do. Okay? I don't like to think we cannot do. I wouldn't be here in the US if you know, we, couldn't, we cannot do things, right? Because the way I arrive here is just by me doing like, I'm gonna do it. You know, I'm gonna go there, New York. What's in New York? Oh, there's NYU in New York, right? So I'm in the business of figuring out how to do it. So when I arrived at IU, I wanted to do this. And I already had like 15 collaborations, right? And I knew that I was gonna take time. And I knew that I wanted to get tenure. And I actually talked to the dean and said, what's going to happen to me if I collaborate with 50 researchers over the next two, three years? Is it going to impair my tenure process? Right? Because it's part of your question, right? So if you are in, in, in the humanities and your tenure is given to you by a book, right, written by you, how do you handle that? Right? How do you collaborate? Right? So uh, there's limits, but for me it's more like, what do we change from, the, from every level, right? How do we change the training to the students? How do we build the technology? How do we change the IRBs that we, and generate the one that we need? How do we talk about ethics? But how do we talk also about our jobs and the administration in such a way that, well, you know, if it brings money to the university and impacts to the research and better understanding, maybe we do need to do what physics do, right? They collaborate and they do great, right? And we don't, or in some fields people don't, and do we do as great, right? What is the impact that each field is given to the general fields of science? I want to see a plot between impact and number of authors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.